Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Yemi Sikumbi. I'm Assistant Professor of Dermatology and Pathology at the Mayo Clinic, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Mei Chang, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology and Dermatology at the University of Michigan. We're going to be discussing her interest in vulvar dermatopathology and specifically in the areas of anal genital squamous proliferations. Thank you for chatting with me today, Dr. Chan. Thank you for having me. And, you know, every time I think about this unique area of dermatopathology or when we have folks who have a specialty area, I'm always wondering how they made their way to this path. Do you mind sharing how you developed an interest and expertise in this area? Sure. I think I my problem usually is about, like, the fact that I like everything. So I, my, I guess my ultimate goal is to be a generalist in yeah. dermatopathology, but I figure you do have to develop some... Um, specialized areas. For me, when I was a trainee, I had the opportunity to work on a vulvar dermatosis project with my one of my mentors, Mary Jane Zimorowski at Beth Israel Deaconess. And um, we basically reviewed almost 200 cases of vulvar inflammatory dermatosis. And I think it's one way to basically just look at a lot of cases and get good at it and then write a nice paper about it. So that's kind of how I found one niche um, in dermatopathology and mm. I'm still trying to carry it on okay. today. And, and I think it's a great niche to have. I, I think that a lot of us who practice dermatopathology, the vulva area, we don't get a lot of specimens, so it's an area that we're mm -hmm. you know, consistently you know, trying to improve our skill sets. And one of the questions I've always had, I'm a clinician, so I see these patients and you have a lesion that looks like a subarachnoid keratosis, maybe looks like a, a condyloma, it's mm -hmm. not on the vulva, perhaps in the inguinal fold or mm -hmm. suprapubic area. Histologically, you see features of a subarachnoid keratosis, mm -hmm. you even see these pseudohorn cysts. How do you characterize these lesions? Do you sign them out as subarachnoid keratosis based on just the morphology you see on histopathology? Or are you calling these condyloma? How do you make right. that decision? Right, that's a great question, and we encounter that not infrequently. Mm -hmm. So basically, if I have a separate keratosis-like lesion in those areas, I would look very hard for anything that looks remotely suggestive of a coilocyte. Okay. Even one little guy I, that looks <laughs> kind of like a coilocyte, yeah. I'll take it and I'll okay. call it a condyloma. And you just run with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And or even if I don't see great coilocytes, if it has that undulating architecture, which is not very usual if it's like truly as as an SK on the skin, yeah. then I would probably still also just call it condyloma. Um, if it is truly like a more rigid looking flat based SK, um, I would top line it separate keratosis and include a comment saying that a subset of genital um, separate keratoses are HPV related. So clinical pathologic correlation is recommended. So yeah. kind of leave the door open. Okay. And I think I think that's very important because on the clinical side of things, sometimes, you know, you bottle line these lesions as uh, condylomas and get patients sort of freak out and they right. get really anxious about it. And so my question in that regard is when do you decide to do testing for low risk HPV? You know, mm. the ASDP came up with their purpose use criteria. And I know there are different opportunities. You can either do like PCR DNA mm. sequencing, in situ hybridization or immunohistochemical stains. How do you decide when to do those tests and when you do decide which modality do you tend to, to utilize? So to be honest with you, if I'm handling SK-like lesions as I just told you, mm -hmm. I don't typically do the low-risk HPV test for okay. that because I'm sort of leaving the door open if okay. I'm not sure. Um, having said that, um, I happen to be the IHC lab director at okay. my institution, so it is on our list, kind of on our wish list to okay. get the low-risk HPV-ish. Okay. Um, and I prefer ish because currently we do the high-risk HPV-ish, RNA. Ish, which which performs very well in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Okay. And in a way, I almost feel like it's more important to have the low risk HPV because mm. that obviously, like you said, it has important clinical mm -hmm. implication, whether it's condyloma or not. Um, and secondly, for high risk HPV, you do have H, um, P16 in yeah. addition to high risk HPV. Yeah. So you at least have something additional, whereas yes. low risk HPV, you mm. really have to rely on at least one method. Yeah. So I my preferred method is ish because it's easily accessible, mm -hmm. fast turnaround time. Basically, okay. you get it the same 
basically the same turnaround time as sure. for IHC. Sure. And that's a good point. Like you mentioned, when you're thinking about high-risk HPV neoplasms and you're thinking about atypical squamous proliferations in that category, we do have P16 right. readily available. And mm -hmm. Most uh, most um, centers have that. Mm -hmm. Most private you know practices have that easily right. accessible. The other question, just tagging, tagging along to that concept, is when we're now characterizing the you know other neoplasms in this category, we know that we've always thought when I was a dermatology resident, we, we, I was trained that giant condyloma, you know, Bushke Lowenstein, that we thought of it as verrucous carcinoma. We clumped it up with, you know, epithelioma cuniculatum. We clumped it with oral florid papillomatosis. But now we do know that verrucous carcinoma tends to actually be HPV negative. Mm -hmm. How has that changed how you classify these anogenital neoplasms based on what we know about HPV? Right. So, yeah, HPV is definitely very important mm -hmm. to um, classify these lesions. And that's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Historically, um, I remember just maybe a decade ago when mm -hmm. I was still a trainee, I learned that some pathologists would view um, giant condyloma of Bushkin, Lowenstein, and Verrucous carcinoma kind of synonymous. Yeah. And um, But then I've seen pathologists kind of fight yes. <laughs> other Always. pathologists. Controversy, with, yeah. Exactly, yeah. very controversial. Yeah. Others would be like, well, if you look at, if you go by the strict criteria, the original description of verrucous carcinoma, mm -hmm. you really are not supposed to see coilocytosis. Mm -hmm. Whereas in giant condyloma, you basically you always have, do. You yes. always do. You always do, yeah. Um, so I think to solve that controversy, the HPV test has helped a lot yeah. in that regard. Um, so as you already know, like pretty much all giant condylomas should have high-risk mm -hmm. HPV, whereas um, verrucous carcinoma typically does not. So that really helps elucidating the biology behind the two lesions and support that they're really distinct entities. Okay. Yeah. So. You know, tagging along um, when, when we're now moving ourselves to the atypical uh, proliferations in this, uh, you know, genital region, I've always, when we think about Bowen's disease and squamous cell carcinoma in situ, the appropriate terminology when we're dealing mm -hmm. this particular anatomy really should be the the high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, mm -hmm. right? That should mm -hmm. be the bottom line. We should be more consistent with that. What I'm struggling with is when I've been correct in that terminology, the gynecologists are very familiar. It's mm -hmm. what they're comfortable with, but dermatologists prefer. Mm -hmm. What What are you saying? Is mm -hmm. that Bowen's? What is that? Right. How do you? How are you dealing with that? How do you bottom line that diagnosis? Yeah. So. Um, the first thing I look at is who sent us the biopsy. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. if I know it's from a gynecologist or a urologist, I I would start with high so high grade so high grade um, squamous intraepithelial lesion, um, but knowing that a dermatologist might still be reading that report, yeah. so I would still put squamous cell carcinoma in situ in parentheses after okay. that. Yeah. And um, you would wish that they can all speak the same language yes. and have a more unified um, terminology to this yeah. area, but the truth is that it's not, at least not yeah. currently. Yeah. So you have to include all the mm -hmm. different terminologies. For example, our urologist there for PEIN, penile, um, intraepithelial neoplasia, they also kind of classify things as to warty yeah. PIN versus oh basaloid PIN versus okay. differentiated PIN, just like DVIN. Yeah. So um, I would include that terminology as well because okay. they would like to know. Yeah. yeah, And I think it goes back to what we always do in tomatopathology, sort of thinking of the client, which is usually the clinician behind, mm -hmm. and how can our report be as helpful for them without right. confusing them to help in terms of uh, taking care taking care of mm -hmm. patients. And I've started going into that, sort of using the high-grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasm and then sort of parentheses, mm -hmm. I put, I put um, Bowen's disease to sort of mm -hmm. clarify that we're talking about the same thing, right. but it's helpful even for research purposes that we stay consistent mm -hmm. um, exactly. in that designation. Mm -hmm. When we think about inflammatory, I think that's a whole can of worms, but when we think about just inflammatory uh, dermatopathology for vulva, or just even the entire area of vulva dermatopathology, what do you think that as dermatopathologists, we don't see a lot of these specimens, how can we improve our diagnostic accuracy and get more comfortable, comfortable with these cases? Right, yeah, I'm a strong believer that the more you see, the better you mm -hmm. get. So the bottom line is you have to be able to see those cases. Yeah. Um, so I'm lucky in that I, in addition to DermPath, mm -hmm. I sign out some search path. Yeah. 
So perhaps in my colleagues' eyes, I'm sort of like a pseudo-surgical pathologist. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they, they're more, perhaps a little more likely to show me those cases okay. um, when they have um, like a follow-up biopsy mm -hmm. that they need help with. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I really appreciated that because mm -hmm. I, I figured, again, if I want to be good at something, I have to have the opportunity to get access yeah. to those specimens. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, vulvar dermatoses, mm -hmm. inflammatory dermatoses yes. is something that they would definitely appreciate our yeah. help with. Yes. So um, if, you're, if that's something that you're really interested in, mm -hmm. you definitely have to let them know because yeah. they would appreciate it. Yeah. And that would really help establish a good relationship. So okay. next time they have a vulvar dermatosis, they'll share, share their yes. go-to person. Yeah. Um, and um, I feel like also, in an academic setting, um, it also helps. For example, I had a resident who came to me and said, I want to learn more about vulvar inflammatory dermatoses. How can I do that? And because of my own experience when I was a trainee, I would say, well, why don't we come up with a good question? And to answer that question, we'll pull a lot of cases and maybe we'll get a project out of it. Mm -hmm. So it really will be a time well spent. You sure. learn from it yeah. and you even get a paper, yeah. contribute to the yeah. literature. Mm -hmm. um, kind of similarly, I think in an academic s setting, you can also write a review paper that sure. really forces you to yeah. um, learn about the literature yeah. and be good at something or give a talk yeah. to the trainees. Yeah. I'm sure that's an area that anyone can benefit yeah. from. And I think that you're uniquely positioned to do this very successfully. Like you mentioned with your background um, in your training and the fact that you collaborate with your colleagues mm -hmm. in GU pathology mm -hmm. and in gynecologic pathology, mm -hmm. I think it really does lend to developing, getting the volume to develop expertise mm -hmm. um, really, um, really in this field and I, I do know that it's a it's something that we need within our specialty. We just had a wonderful course today on the oh, verge right. talking about uh, mucocutaneous dermatopathology and I think that we don't get a lot of it so I think um, learning as much as we can is always mm -hmm. very important. Do you have any final pearls for our audience? Mm -hmm. Things that just in your practice lessons you've learned that you'd like to share? Sure. Um, it may sound a little cliche, yeah. um, but I do feel like cl knowing the clinical correlation is absolutely yeah. important yeah. in vulvar dermatopathology. Um, I think one example would be like bolinoid pepilosis, for example. I think anyone, if you're not aware of bolinoid pepilosis, anyone would look at it and chances are one might just call it SCCIS next case. Yeah. Um, but knowing that if the patient is immunosuppressed mm -hmm. and these are multiple discrete mm -hmm. papules, then that would obviously mm -hmm. change your mm -hmm. um, impression mm -hmm. and consider bolinoid mm -hmm. pepilosis. And I think under the microscope, one clue that I often use is pigmentation. Okay. I feel like most SCCIS, regular SCCIS in the anogenital areas usually are not distinctively pigmented. Okay. So if I see an S, what looks like SCCIS but with pretty prominent basal pigmentation, at least that would serve as a clue to me okay. to find out more about the clinical. How many lesions are they papular lesions? Is the patient immunosuppressed, etc. Sure. Um, and that would help me um, render the correct diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have access to that information, um, I would top line it um, as full thickness squamous atypia, C comment. Okay. And then explain that clinical correlation is recommended. And say, you know, if there are multiple lesions, consider exactly. a boinoid papillosis if it's an isolated lesion. Exactly. It's going to sell carcinoma, yeah. carcinoma right. in situ. And, and that yeah. could affect yeah. clinical um, treatment. So sure. that would be important. Yeah. 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 And also, uh, just last week, I think, um, I uh, one of my GYN pathologist colleague um, kindly shared a case with me. Clinically, it was thought to be maybe condyloma, but... Um, but histologically, it looks like a giant skin tag. Not hmm. very impressive, yeah. but the epithelium is kind of focally ulcerated, kind of mm -hmm. multifocally mm -hmm. ulcerated. And then when I zoom in, there are actually um, herpes inclusions. Oh. So just to keep a broad differential, not all mass-forming anogenital infections are HPV. So in this case, it mm -hmm. was a cool case of herpes simplex vegetans, mm -hmm. which oh, can wow. be mass-forming yeah. in a chronic um, setting or um, condyloma lata, secondary to secondary syphilis, which yeah. is rare, but yeah. we all know that yeah. syphilis is coming back. Yes. And that can be mass forming, because mm. just because syphilis can do anything they yeah. want. Um, so that's another thing that you have to think okay. about and yeah. do the appropriate testing. Yeah. yeah. So sort of thinking outside the box, I think 
one of the things that it was in one of your in your papers when when I read that I, I thought oh boy I could relate to this because I feel like with vulva people have just a very narrow differential mm -hmm. in inflammatory they're usually looking for lichen sclerosis or yeah. lichen simplex chronicus right. but like you're you're nicely mentioning is just thinking outside the box so that we don't miss other things so right. with infections we focus just on HPV mm -hmm. but of course you can have herpes infection syphilis right. uh, molluscum I've seen in that right. area mm -hmm. so just always keeping a broad differential exactly well thank you so much for taking your time to chat with me today I've learned a few practical clues tips to take to my practice and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting of course thank you so much for having me you're welcome